More than sharing breakfast with you today, I actually wanted to share a little bit more about food, which is what my practice has become over these years. And so I've titled it Food Is, so we can start looking beyond just the ingredients that make up the things that feed us every day and start thinking about them in greater contexts. So some short history about me. I grew up in Joliet, Illinois, to a French mother and an American father. And for those of you who don't know where Juliet, Illinois is, if you've ever watched The Blues Brothers, it's where they leave jail in the beginning. <laughs> so this <laughs> was quite the paradox of existence. And we would spend school years in America, and then in, Fr uh, in summers we would go to France. And as I went back and forth between these countries as a child, I started to question my personal identity, obviously, and that was naturally tied to my cultural identity. And the greatest difference that I found was in how people fed themselves, whether they gathered around tables or around TVs, whether food was packaged or prepared, whether it came out of a box or from a home. Um, and as I started to notice these differences, I also noticed that these behaviors were the foundation of all consumption behaviors. How people ate was how they behaved, how they consumed relationships, cars, schools, money, etc. cetera. Um, and that's nothing new. I think since the beginning of dawn, and I love this image, right? <laughs> Mankind has gathered around food, these convivial spaces where we share stories together. And these stories start to become the fabric of our culture, right? And given this depth, this understanding that food was so much more than an ingredient, this is a drawing I made for this uh, Love Food book, which Kevin mentioned earlier, really started to give me an understanding that food was an incredibly complex system that went beyond just an ingredient and really was about culture, about emotions, about forms, about so much. And given that depth, you'll see that over these last years, I've really tried to dedicate myself to expanding the definition of what food is. Um, a quick historical interlude about myself. As was mentioned, I studied modern dance and uh, screenwriting as an undergraduate student. And very quickly, as a hot-headed 21-year-old, uh, decided that I could not work for anyone else. And so I went out and I worked as a photographer. And so for about five to six years, I photographed. And most of that photography ended up being around food. I was working in bars and restaurants and became friends with chefs. So this is something that I actually still continue to practice today. But the medium itself was limiting. It was two dimensions. And as you saw, I think I've always existed in four, maybe. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to be able to affect storytelling in a more robust way. So I went back to school and I got a degree in industrial design. And I made all of this. If you want to talk about strategies for the future of flat screen TVs after this, I can do that. But <laughs> um, this, uh, this lasted for about five to six years. I practiced very classically as an industrial designer. But in doing so, I started to lose a little bit of myself. And I think that's something that, as creatives, we all go through. Um, it started to be very much about other, and I started not feeding myself anymore. And so what did I do? I went back, as you heard, to the most fundamental thing that had made me, and that was food. Um, and in doing so, and in bringing all of my experience as a creative to it, I really wanted to understand not just what feeds me, but what feeds you, but what feeds us. So the first thing that I made, had to do with myself, obviously. And this was a gesture to the world. And what a gesture it was. I cast my left breast in jello. Uh, <laughs> this is it, now you all know. It was made, <laughs> it's made of uh, hand squeezed watermelon juice and peach juice. I squeezed them myself. And when you cut into it, uh, the interior of it was a Lapsang Souchong panna cotta, which if you know what Lapsang Souchong is, it's kind of this dirty, smoky tea you get the literal metaphor, right? You cut into it and it's dirty. So this was part of the annual Gowanus Jello competition. And so people came and they actually ate it. Some were very afraid. <laughs> but it was a literal gesture to the world that says, here I am. 
I'm ready to work in this space and be fed and feed you. Um, and in doing so, that kind of laid the personal history for my practice. And that's, I think, given, given my background, it's something that I'm really interested in as well. So I made this. This is a, called the food bank. It was a mobile sound booth in which guests were invited to come in and record their personal food memories. And I have about 150 of them now. And the goal of them is to create an oral archive of food, of our food histories, and create a virtual cookbook in which we don't search by ingredient, but we search by emotion, event, and location. And through those histories, I think why I'm interested in collecting them is together they start to lay the fabric for traditions. Right? These are the stories that start to implicate new behaviors, new rituals. Um, and this is one of those traditions that I was surrounded by as a kid and I was not allowed to eat. This was the stuff of gods. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yoo-hoo, fun dip, Welch's, soda, grape soda. Oh, I was eating puree à la crème while you were eating Cheetos. And that sounds nice, but it wasn't fun for a nine-year-old. So when I got licensed to practice myself, um, I obviously reflect a lot on my personal history when I make work. And as was mentioned, I made this book called Junk Foodie, and it's 51 delicious recipes for the lowbrow gourmand, which literally brings together my two cultures, two traditions, one of a gastronomic cuisine and one of an industrial cuisine, which I do believe is, until now, I think, one of the cuisines that defines America. And what happened was 51 recipes from breakfast snacks to amuse-bouches to cocktails that took all the gastronomic recipes that I grew up with as a child and remade them only using American junk food. Um, it was an amazing, amazing project, which resulted in me developing techniques like the smash, which you see here, which uses the bag as a means to pulverize any sort of crispy treat. Uh, and one of, the, one of the recipes that I want to share with you, which is my favorite, is the Twinkie Napoleon. So if you know what a Napoleon is, it's a French pastry that uses layers of puff pastry alternating with pastry cream. It's delicious. It sort of has this like crispy, crunchy, sweet, savory thing that goes on in your mouth. And I made it using only uh, Twinkies and potato chips. You too can try this at home. And you take the Twinkie, you cut it open, and then you reserve the cream from the inside. And the amazing thing about Twinkies is that the cake, due to its emulsifiers, you actually, if you squish it, uh, it becomes dough very, very easily again. And you can roll it out and make very thin layers, and then you retop it with cream, and then you practice the smash on the potato chips, and then sprinkle, right? And then you repeat this layering effect. And what you have when you put it in your mouth is almost the exact same feeling and taste as a Napoleon. Right? These textures and materials from our culture are actually able to inform another culture, thereby bringing a totally new look and a point of entry into something that we think of perhaps as a very base, base food. Uh, here are two others. This is a very, very jelly belly clafouti made of a grape utz pie, vanilla pudding, and very cherry jelly bellies. And here you thought the macaron craze was over. No, this is a circus peanut aron. It's made with circus peanuts, mound bars, the inside of a mounds bars, and fun dip. <laughs> it didn't stop there. I then made workshops. <laughs> so I invited people to come and actually make their own junk food recipes, right? Starting, these are, and these are practices, right? Traditions may exist in forms of recipes, but they only become ours when we practice them with our bodies. So people would come and they could choose from a variety of junk food ingredients and make their own new highbrow snacks. Um, here's a fave, Handy Cool Matches by Cullen. And you can see from the look on his face, this is sure to go to market soon. It like <laughs> lights you on fire or something like this while crisping. <laughs> and I think something that all of this does is it actually creates community. As I said in the beginning, food is something that brings us all together. It brings us here together. Um, and a project that actually started to explore that in many dimensions was something that I did a few years ago, and it was a temporary restaurant installation that happened in Soho called What Happens When? And I don't know, some of you may have gone to it. It was to exist over nine months. This is the branding that I made for it. Each of these icons represents a different movement, as we called it. And those movements were 30 days. And 
the inspiration behind this was to start to bring together the elements actually that feed us in a dining context. Food, design, the interior design of the space and the soundscape of the space. And this is a project that I did with chef John Frazier of Dovetail Restaurant and Ella Kunos de Vos of the Metrics Design Group who did the interior design. And we funded it on Kickstarter as a way to start thinking about community, right? So we asked our patrons not only to help us financially, but also to donate themes for each of the months. And so what you started to see was this kind of design charrette that would happen every 30 days. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. I don't suggest it. You don't sleep very much, but <laughs> you are fed in incredible ways. It was located on Kenmar Street in Cleveland Place, and it was a former French restaurant that we transformed. In the first month, uh, we actually invited everyone kind of to come into our house. That's what this icon was about. And it was very simple. We asked you to come into our creative process. We painted the entire interior black, sort of like a black box theater, and laid on the floor the one-to-one -one scale drawings of the floor plan, of the elevations, of the reflected ceiling plan. The ceiling itself was strung with 400 hooks, so you could move and change and shape things as needed. Um, and kind of with this, this fundamental layer, the food also reflected that. It was very ingredient-driven, Scandinavian-inspired. The food was fresh, clean, and pure. The second movement, uh, was inspired by a suggestion of a childhood fantasy forest. And there, we transformed the space into sort of this magical abstract uh, forestry that you started to see these, these large scale volumes that would run across the room, little swings here, these kind of little vignettes and moments made of moss and birds, surprise discoveries all around. We saw animal tracks, I think you see them in the lower corner there, sometimes would also run across the tables. The food, this movement was dense, it was rich, it was a lot of wild game. Our third movement was inspired by Renoir's boat party, and so we very simply made it. <laughs> the food, this movement, was a deconstructed, kind of a classic, luxurious French picnic. And then we moved kind of back home, and we were inspired by jazz. Um, and what happened in this space is that the tempo and the rhythm of jazz were something we wanted to communicate, right? And so the ceiling was strung with wire that had different movements to it. There were large abstract sculptures that were to represent the instruments from which this music is created. And the food here was classically American, big steaks, double baked potatoes. You know, it was, and all of these things would come together and start to make you look beyond the plate and actually understand that all of these elements were feeding us every time that we ate. And then, drama of drama, we lost our liquor license. I know, so I made this. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we made this, we made our own prohibition campaign. Uh, <laughs> but it's no fun to stay open without any alcohol. Uh, so we closed our doors, unfortunately. Uh, but there actually was one last movement that was designed and it was to be inspired by the Spice Road. And nobody ever dined in it, but I wanted to share it with you today. Um, we designed this. Ella made these amazing, amazing patterns. So this is what you would have all eaten in. And I think what this starts to illustrate is that food is a very, very complex system, right? There are all of these elements that come into that. What happens when started to touch on it? Uh, but food exists beyond restaurants as well. It's something that happens in our cityscape. And a few years ago, I was approached by 34th Street Partnership. They're the business improvement district for 34th Street and Bryant Park. Uh, and they asked me to look at this, you know, icon of New York City, the food cart, right? But it's smelly, it's kind of stinky, the food isn't so good. And 34th Street is in charge of public beautification to make our public spaces gorgeous. Uh, and they wanted me to try to see what we could do to solve the problem of food carts. So I, along with a colleague, Sinclair Scott Smith, um, we went around and we actually met every single food cart vendor in 34th Street. And this was in like January, February, March. <laughs> uh, we interviewed all of them. We noted the time of their work, their location of work, what kind of food they were doing. And in, and in exploring this, we started to create a system map of how food cart vending worked. And through this research, we met, um, a food cart vendor. 
And the goal of the project was to understand the system of food, to understand the sourcing of it, the storing of it, the preparation of it, the distribution of it, and then also to engage an actual vendor to try to transform that system. And so with Nabil, we actually took this and made it into this. Uh, and it was a project called Project Food Carts, which was a prototype. And we brought healthier, more sustainable food offerings to New York City. And I think that this is just, it's a small, it's a small ode to something that I think that when we, when we start to engage personally, we really actually have the power to transform not just ourselves, but our cityscapes as well. On the flip side of this, um, something I'm personally interested in as well, is that throughout these systems, throughout these communities, throughout these traditions, everything that we do as human beings is actually a performance. You know, we are actors in our own lives. And I think that this systems project is an example of that. Um, and performances exist everywhere, right? They exist right here in front of you. And this is another element that food actually mediates. Food is a performance. You go to restaurants, you're an actor in their play, right? You invite me over to dinner, I'm an, act I'm an actor in your play. Uh, and this is a project that explores that. This is a dinner that I was commissioned to do at MPAC. It's the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center in Troy, New York. And I did that this last winter. And what you see in front of you is uh, 60 feet of a spandex table. <laughs> and this dinner was to support the premiere of a dance piece by a choreographer named Ralph Lemon. And the goal of the dinner was to explore the role of performance. How could it exist beyond this stage, right? Where else are the venues for performance? And for the arts, this is something, for the performing arts, this is a question that is very timely. Uh, and so 60 of the top art curators from across the world came together to discuss this, sorry, across the United States. And I created this landscape that actually changed from dawn until dusk. So as the lighting changed, the shape of the table changed just through shadow play, right? And guests were invited to sit within it and dine. But beyond just sitting, uh, we started to see the, a slight suggestion of these spaces change. I laser cut all these napkins for each of the guests and their names were projected across the surface. And I think one of the nicest things that I overheard <laughs> during this time was someone walk in and look at her partner and say, have you found yourself yet? <laughs> so, as they sat in it, you see that the chairs are also stretched in spandex. And what happened is that people were suddenly physically implicated in it. You were sitting in this fabric, you were actually suspended in it. And so the whole thing was almost hugging you. So suddenly your body changed a little bit and you started to have physical touch points of where you were. And something slightly different. You know, that started to mediate perhaps an understanding that dinner is not just dinner. And the other beautiful surprise about this was that you see that there are two surfaces here, right? There are these sort of peaks and valleys. The peaks were hard, so we could put glasses on them. The valleys are soft, right? And so as the food was plated in different spaces, it would move and bounce. So it actually performed for you, thereby inversing the relationship of diner to food audience and performer. And I think these spaces in between are also to reflect on. A simple example is, is restaurant choreography, which is also called service, right? You have movements that take you from one place to another. If you've ever watched master servers, it's the most beautiful thing in the world, right? These efficiencies of movements. And it's something with my dance background that I'm also very interested in revealing, is that food goes beyond just the artifact, right? There's all this space in between from hand to mouth that really starts to dictate and define how we taste. Uh, and this is a test project that I did in the, in the winter as well that I wanted to share some examples of with you. And it actually is a, the dancing of a mise en place for a sauce. Um, so here was my test surface. I bought a door and some sawhorses. <laughs> and the goal was to bodily dance the mise en place of this sauce. And uh, mise en place is the preparation of ingredients for a meal. Normally we do these things with knives, with spoons, with whips. Um, I did it with myself. So this is my leg in avocado, pomegranate, honeycomb, tomatoes, 
and running through persimmons. Which if I ever have a band will be the title of it. <laughs> and in that space, and that is obviously more of an abstract expression, but what starts to come from it is that at base, food really is emotion. It, it has this amazing power as a material to actually give form to feeling. Um, and I've been working with the Museum of Sex over the last few years, and specifically I've been researching aphrodisiacs. And something that's come out of that research is the, is the great discovery that you know, no singular ingredient will ever make you fall in love with you, no. It is about the narratives around these ingredients that create the emotion that create love. So last year, I embarked on this amazing adventure and I asked 15 really incredible chefs and mixologists to define what love was for them through food and drink. Um, and these are them. And I traveled across the world from Bali to Belgium to Chicago and Paris. And the testament of that is a book called Love Food Book, Le Libertinage Gourmand. It's published in French. Um, and it brought together all of these recipes from sweet to savory to cocktails. It started to give a new language to this very ephemeral thing that we call love, right? In a contemporary lexicon that goes beyond old stories about Montezuma drinking chocolate and Casanova liking oysters. No, these are the expressions of today of some of the greatest culinary talents that I have the privilege of knowing. And I wanted to share a few of them with you here. Uh, this is one that's very dear to my heart. It's from a man named Kobe Deschamers. He has a restaurant called Indewolf in Belgium. And when I asked Kobe what love was, he said, it's this. These are two pigeons. <laughs> and Kobe actually cooks in the farm that he grew up in. And he said, you know, when I was little living here, uh, I had these two pigeons and they were my best friends. I would feed them every day. I would play with them. Uh, you know, and I watched them grow and change shape and their characters develop. And he said, and then one day my mother came up to me and she said, Kobe, we have to kill the pigeons. And he said, why? And she said, because we have to eat. And his first definition of love was sacrifice. And this is something that goes far beyond this room. It's something that many people all around the world face every single day. And what Kobe did is he took that and on his menu to this day, he has this dish which is pigeon, and he takes pigeons and he stuffs them with hay and lets them ferment for two weeks. And then the meat becomes very soft, tender, a little bitter, and then he cooks them in hay butter. Making this an actual ode to this bittersweet emotion that stays with you, and it's an incredible experience because you are able to feel what he feels. I then went to Chicago to Moto restaurant where Richard Farina said, this is what love is, it's about discovery. And this is a vegan dish on a log. <laughs> and as you dig through it, they're all little microgreens. These are small scones in the middle. And you start to discover absolute wonder in the minutia and the detail of this meal, right? True, true discovery on a very micro scale. I came back to Brooklyn then and worked with Ignacio Matos, who was at Isa restaurant at the time. And Ignacio is an amazing, amazing human. And he said, this is what love is for me. It's passion, it is my work. He said, but in order for that to be communicated to others, I have to create boundaries. Because I'm in the kitchen with all sorts of people, all sorts of different levels, all sorts of different skill sets every single day. And so what Ignacio did is he transformed basically this into this. And if you've ever had the great privilege of eating this stick tartare, oh, Blessed are you, it's incredible. <laughs> this is a little flax seed, rye bread soil, creme fraiche and juniper berries. And when you eat it, it has these like amazing sensual explosions that happen in your mouth. But for Ignacio to be able to communicate this, to communicate this love of cooking, he had to create a template. And so he very simply made molds, right? These are simple circular molds that allow anyone at any scale and any level to be able to replicate his love and his passion. Also in Chicago is a man named Ben Roche, who was the pastry chef at Moto at that time. And I love this one. Uh, ben said, oh, love is surprise. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. And though this is quite small on or quite big on screen, it's actually quite small in real life. And it's a gin jelly. And 
you take this little thing and you put it in your mouth, oh, and what is solid becomes liquid, right? This is a micro rhubarb, and in the center is something called a pine berry. It's like an albino strawberry, and it's, like, it's nature's junk food. You put it in your mouth and it tastes like bubble gum. Oh, it's incredible. So all of these things, what you see is not what you get. And for Ben, that really was an element of what true love is. And through all these things, and what I mentioned before, is that all of these emotions, all of these recipes, all of these narratives, they elicit feelings in us, right? Food is feeling. It makes us feel all over the place. Feelings are not food, though. Let us remember that. Uh, and so to bring that to life, this is the last project that I want to share with you this morning, which I can only share one slide, but it's a project with the Museum of Sex. So all of these years of research are actually coming to fruition, and we're opening a bar in this summer called Play that has as a goal to give form to these emotions through different feelings, through the playful engagement of artists, chefs, and mixologists. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. I'm not finished. <laughs> But I think what you can see through this is that beyond the singular ingredient, food is all of these. It is self, it is history, it is community, it is systems, it is performance, choreography, emotion, feeling. All of these things feed us every day. Right? And if we bring them together thoughtfully, if we actually design them, we can start to create healthier, more sustainable ecosystems on all scales. Right? Food is design. It's the assembly of multiple parts. And design is also feeding, right? We're all creatives, most likely, in this room. And it's something that we practice every day, both professionally and personally. And everything that I've shown you today is a, is a taste, just, of what I try to practice daily. I am an omnivore, for better or worse. Um, but these things have fed me in ways I can't even begin to describe. They've fed many others but what they've done for me is transformational. And that's the one thing that I would leave you with this morning, is to remember this, to feed yourself so you can feed others and be fed. And if that is a practice that we can try to do every single day, ourselves and as a culture, I think we might just make it a little bit more delicious of a place. Thank you. <laughs>